Hi, I'm Paul Caulfield, guest host of Cybercrime Magazine and Chief Risk Officer at IDB Bank. We're here on Broadway in New York City in the New York Institute of Technology. With us are CEO and founder of CyberArk, Udi Makati, and Chief Risk Officer of IDB Bank, Essen Sheik. Guys, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Let me frame the, the conversation. We're talking about privilege access management, which your company started back in 1999. Right. So we're talking about a granddaddy when you consider it. Walk us through pre-online, pre-mobile, pre-digital, and how PAM started and how it's evolved over the years. Oh, uh, absolutely, and uh, great to talk to you here. Uh, I think the beauty of the Cyborg story to fast forward is we pioneered the space but continue to innovate and market lead it. A lot of companies don't pioneer a space but don't, uh, uh, don't capture it, and we really focused on customers to, to capture the journey. Uh, in the early days, uh, we discovered that these are the keys to the kingdom, and uh, privilege access is uh, the holy grail of an insider trying to do anything um, uh, malicious or even negligent or just uh, curiosity killed the cat mm -hmm. of, of, of moving uh, within, uh, within the network. Uh, over the years, it really, uh, the, the drivers for privilege access uh, management really evolved and a lot of compliance drivers uh, uh, were added uh, to the mix where you have to show who can access what in an organization, especially what can IT people do. Uh, and in recent years, with the advanced attacks, it's become very clear that in almost every major attack, uh, privilege access was the attack vector, um, especially to get the goods, get mm -hmm. uh, privilege access to a database, get uh, a full control of uh, domain and, and, and access of the network. So I would say those three continue to this day, mm -hmm. insider threat, compliance, and advanced threat uh, protection as, as so drivers. if you were talking to a new board member and, and, and he or she had never heard of, of, of PAM before, how would you get it at the, at the board level or the 50,000 foot level? Oh, ab absolutely. I would say every business, uh, Mr. Board Member, whether you're running a, a, a bank or even a trucking company, uh, every business runs on, on technology. And forever, technology needs to be managed uh, and administered uh, either by humans or sometimes by, by computers that are, are managing the infrastructure. And they hold the keys to the kingdom. And uh, when an attacker, insider or outsider, gets those keys to the kingdom, they can do anything to the IT infrastructure and hence to the corporation. So a major risk to the organization is to not secure those keys to the kingdom. Um, but you achieve a major risk reduction and also enablement if you put controls, enable trusted people to do what they need to do, enable de developers to adopt digital transformation, um, and, um, and, and kind of the best of both worlds mm -hmm. with this layer. Okay, so Essen, IDB Bank, it's the largest Israeli-owned uh, foreign financial institution, clients throughout the U.S., Latin America, and obviously strong ties with Israel. Your career, having started back in 1991, what I have saw in your career, and thankfully we're working together, is you've got good first and second line experience. So tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit about the differences between being on the line, first line of defense, and second line, and maybe some of those kind of threat vectors that you are challenged against from first and second line. Right, so Paul, thank you for uh, the conversation. Uh, I started my career in the first line of defense in the 1990s, and within the IT organization supporting the infrastructure operations, which included not only the IT ITEL model, which is basically the IT strategy, transition, and sustainability, but also looking at the information security from end to end at the operational level, right? The governance piece, since it was a small organization, a clinical laboratory, more everything governance and operation was combined together. So that's what we were like supporting at that point of time. It was something a very valuable experience. If you visualize the pyramid, tip being the, the giving you an overview of the information security at a high level. The bottom layer of the pyramid is more different aspects of the technology, which gives you a good breadth of foundational information and knowledge base to make sure you understand the risk in different silos of the technology. So that gives me a good uh, aspiration on that side, not to mention about like working with different aspect of colleagues 
who mentored me on a different aspect, understanding what the network is, what the application is, what the databases are, different layers of access, and where the privilege accounts and the threat vectors are being used at a little movement across the network, which can be exploited in one way or the other, gave a good boost up and gave me a good experience. So as you got to the second line, what, it, what did you learn? What were you able to bring with you? So in the second line, when basically, well, actually, just to uh, backtrack, I went from first line to all the way to the fourth line. Mm -hmm. Right when I joined uh, one of the big four consulting company where we did all kinds of security audits. Then also from there I came into the third line before again back and forth I came into the second line and then it was a struggle between uh, more like a first line Which and the second line. Which one you love best. Right. right? <laughs> to be honest with you, I like the second line the better where I am right now. The reason being because I have created a fundamental knowledge base in the first line, looked at it from the risk aspect from the fourth and the third line. Now I am basically endeavoring it from the second line from the governance aspect. Because in my opinion, if you have a strong governance, you can have a strong op cybersecurity operation or the information security operation laid out throughout the landscape of the IT. You mentioned diagnostics, and recently Quest Diagnostics, it just became uh, uh, known, had 12 million customers' information, both financial and health records, compromised. But from your perspective, when you have events like that, whether it's a third party or an insider, like what are some of the challenges that these institutions, because cyber covers healthcare, financial, government, and I believe energy, mostly. But as you're seeing it, uh, I think in the early days we, we saw um, initially um, a demand for financial services. Today we, we really work with all uh, all verticals because everybody has something of value. I've, I've, uh, back to that board member, I've seen somebody in, in, a, in a panel was asked, uh, uh, what if I don't have anything of value and, and, and the, uh, to, to protect against? Uh, and so the answer was, turn back to your shareholders and say, I have nothing of value to protect uh, again. So, so uh, definitely this is healthcare information and, and, uh, and personal uh, information, and we've seen that in the Anthem breach in a different angle where, where they went after uh, uh, this was, this was uh, attributed to, to a nation state or, or ex external party, but going after um, uh, health records. Uh, in this case, um, it, it could be external or, uh, uh, or internal, but there's definitely a monetary value in what they went after. Uh, what we've seen in these major attacks is that to get to a database, to get to that dump of, of uh, all of that data, you need privilege access. You can't go uh, uh, one by one with just the limited user rights. You need to get under the controls over, over IT uh, so to get to that. You have access management and then privileged access management. Explain the difference. Sure. There's, there's just uh, allowing uh, uh, John and Jane to do their, their regular mundane, uh, mundane work, and there's the administration of the IT uh, infrastructure. That's privilege access, and, and it's the humans that need to administer the IT infrastructure that, that are developing. It's the third parties that are giving uh, IT uh, services. Uh, it's even the security uh, devices themselves. Somebody needs to configure a firewall and say open and shut. Uh, that, that function, that's, that is privilege access. Uh, with, with just regular access, you get, you're, you're limited to what the regular user was able to, uh, to get to. Uh, with privilege access, you, you're, you're able to, you can disable security tools, you can create uh, fake, fake users in the network that, that will not be picked up by, uh, by, by security tools, and you can get uh, a full data, full access to databases and, and, and such. And, and so that's why they're uh, the prime vector um, on, in, in sophisticated attacks. Essen, what is what does maturity look like, and then how do you test it, and then what are you testing it with? When you say maturity, maturity from the from a PAM standpoint. From so you, a you've got really good PAM controls. What's it look like, and right. then how are you testing it, and what are you using to test them? So the the maturity, in my opinion, uh, for privileged access management is basically organization identifying what the privilege accounts are. Now, privilege accounts can be of two types. One could be a personal privilege account, the other could be a non-personal privilege account that resides within a system as a default accounts, right? Like a service account, emergency account, local admin accounts, or it could be a personal account. I could be one of the administrator, which can have a permission access to create and also modify and delete the audit logs 
right? That has a privileged elevated access. Uh, if from a hacker perspective you're looking at it, both are at risk because once I get hold of that, I can not only create accounts to hack into a lateral movement into the network, but also modify and delete the audit logs, right? So it, it, it is kind of dual from the elevated aspect. Once they identify those accounts, then the question comes in is, is whether these accounts needs to be in a password vault. Nowadays, like CyberArk has a product called a password vault where you can basically store these keys in those password vault. You can take it out by creating accountability by getting an approval from an approver who approves it which cannot retrieve it at the same time. Right? Once that accountability is created with an account which is non-personal, especially the generic accounts, that gives you a added control in managing that account when you're taking that account and looking into the network. Right now, in the non-technical account, or the technical account, sorry, to create an accountability is the biggest challenge. And putting in the password wall solve that issue. Because with the non-technical account, you can always identify who the user was. It is assigned to my account. I can easily identify in the log that I created those tasks. With a non-technical -technic accounts or a service account, or emergency account, which are generic account, you not be able to do it. The only way you can do it once you put it in the password vault and you take it out with the accountability in it. Woody, one thing I saw, and I think this is right, not necessarily the prevention, but after intrusion, cyber art can, can help uh, mitigate further damage. Uh, our, 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 our biggest mission in life is, is the prevention, and, yeah. and, um, and uh, I'm happy to also dive deep, deep into, into uh, maturity and our approach to, uh, to maturity to get to a point where uh, there's no, we call it no credential left behind. Where, where, where actually an attacker is just cannot live off the land. They, they, they landed maybe somewhere, but they can't find this credential to latch on and, and, and move, uh, move, uh, move further on. That, like, that's, that's true maturity when it comes to the uh, human credentials. I also want to talk about uh, um, uh, application, application credentials. But you are right that un, 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 wasn't planned. Uh, we've been called in as kind of telephone number two by, um, by breached organizations, uh, telephone number one to an incident response firm, and telephone number two was to CyberArk to say, hey, we totally lost control of our network. We don't know anymore who's, who, who's, who's a legitimate user and who's not. We want to rebuild trust and, uh, and basically root them out by rotating mm -hmm. these credentials so that they, they, we know that they no longer have administrative access to our network. We can start cleaning up, create even green zones was a term uh, uh, that is used. So we have that experience. And we turned it back into a program to come back to regular customers and say, hey, these, this is what these guys were doing when they had their backs to the wall and C-level approval to do anything. Uh, now you can proactively actually follow the, we call it the seven steps of, of maturity to, to really go based on risk level and, and reduce the, um, uh, the, the, attack, uh, the attack surface. Uh, we also have functionality that, that allows if, you, if we uh, recognize something anomalous happening with privilege access, we're, we're saying, hey, this is not just a regular user doing something anomalous. This is somebody with, with privilege access. Uh, based on, on policy, the organization can, can actually root them out and, uh, or send them for approval. Uh, because maybe you don't want to stop the, the action in case it's legitimate. Yeah. So that's, that's also in a response uh, type of vector. Uh, and of course, we, we cooperate with a lot of third-party products where if we recognize something, we would feed it so that uh, the customer can consume it in their security operations center. Yeah. You had mentioned, and we're going to talk about a little bit about awareness and training and recruiting. We've had seminal events happening in the regulatory con context uh, for background, the Bank Secrecy Act for anti-money laundering was passed in 1970. But really after 9-11, that seminal event, we've got you know strong compliance controls based on a Patriot Act. What seminal events are you seeing that is driving uh, awareness, understanding uh, resources and the commitment uh, over the past few years? Because it seems like every day something's happening. But are there seminal events that you've seen over the past few years? Yeah. Uh, and let me add. Was there one that led you to found the, the firm back in 1999? 
So, so when so I'll, I'll start. I'll start with the latter. When we started the company, we were two two founders, both served in the Israeli uh, uh, military, and we didn't uh, commercialize an Israeli technology. This is not like the you know the commercial pill that scans the the body that that comes from a military technology. We but we did see that even in military computer centers, when you give access to the IT related uh, folks, people with uh, that that also need to administer. Um, it's very hard to police what they what they are doing. They were not spies. We didn't identify spies during the service. This is not a Snowden-like event. Uh, and this is years before Edward uh, uh, Snowden. Uh, but we did see that with um, uh, the, that IT comes with unlimited access because of the roles they need to do, and that people are snooping just even out of curiosity. We then, uh, after the military, we, we actually went and worked with some local banks, and we saw, oh, wow, that, that picture continues. Uh, the internal uh, IT employees can do uh, and can do everything, and it's almost like uh, assumed, well, we can't do anything about it. They need to run the IT, um, uh, IT infrastructure. So I would say that it was kind of a, a series of awareness uh, uh, events that led us to take the, the approach of vaulting credentials and, and, and securing uh, the insides of enterprises and creating this layer. In terms of awareness in the market, for many years we were educating the market about how impactful the, the privilege attack vector is. But I, I think the, the biggest awareness vectors were the Sony breach where, um, uh, Sony pictures where, where the CEO and others on, 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 the, on, on various magazines talked about once the attackers achieved administrative access, it was game over. We couldn't even trust the system. They were even reading the emails. So they they went out and described that. Uh, I think in in the uh, Office of Personnel Management uh, breach, the OPM breach that was highly publicized here in the U.S., uh, it was the the headline in in major newspapers was uh, a nation state. Well, I shall not name it here because, but it was that was the headline. Achieve, uh, achieve privilege access to the database containing all of the uh, federal employees' uh, uh, information. So I think those two, the Anthem breach was another one where it was publicized that the attack vector, uh, and I would say the inflammation point or the point of no return involved getting to, um, uh, to administrative and, and, and privilege access. And we saw the awareness really uh, move up, uh, and of course, uh, industry analysts have, have, have been have been covering it. Uh, a magic quadrant has come out on the space by by, by Gartner and, and also Forrester just just uh, at the end of 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it's really moving up in in priority and awareness. Mm -hmm. So as we look two, three, five years ahead, and we look at the somewhat vacuum of of talent that's out there, whether it's the leadership or whether it's uh, really qualified staff. You know, first to Essen, w what are you doing to fill that void? Uh, what are you asking for those new personnel or those new uh, uh, capabilities to be able to do, uh, assuming you can read the tea leaves on where the new threat vectors are coming from or the existing threat vectors are just going to become more pervasive? We are trying to make sure that the new talent is aware of the core foundational understanding how the attack is being perpetrated. In many of the school, colleges, that training is still not at the PAW level. Why is that? Is because at the operational level, that training has been given to you when you use various different type of products. Each product has a different feel how to tune, configure, and make sure that needs to be implemented and operationally use it. That knowledge to combine it at a high level and make it a, a, at a theoretical level at the college is, is a big challenge. So when a person is hired from the college, they know the certain foundation, but they cannot put the, uh, the rubber on the, on the road as soon as they get in when they look at the endpoint tool, when they are looking at the DLP or they are looking, we need to still give them certain level of training and understanding as to what threat vector this correlates to or relates to. And that becomes a challenging perspective. Uh, I think uh, with the more evolving cybersecurity landscape, uh, once the academia is going to pick it up more and further reshape itself, 
I think at some point this is going to become much more operational cybersecurity than more like a, 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 a the, the governance cybersecurity piece, which you can just teach it in the books, mm -hmm. but operationally you're not going to be able to learn until you right. resiliency. Right. Resiliency right. is going to be there. So Udi, I love this. I love this question at conferences. What what keeps you up at night? But looking not what keeps you up at night right now but knowing that the 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 nation state actor their intent is uh, becoming some somewhat less financial and more agenda driven where if they can turn out the lights forever they will so what keeps you up at night what's going to keep you up at night and again how are you either developing technologies or solutions or you know staffing up yourself to address them yeah, so so absolutely i think in the in the current what keeps me up at night and and we're addressing that is what i referred to earlier seeing what victim uh, or breached entities are doing and how fast they can really uh, shape their uh, and get up to speed um, and versus uh, some sectors where more regulatory oriented and they they, they equate compliance to being secure and maybe they, they have a checkbox on, on passing PCI or, or passing SOCs because they put controls over some systems, but they are not secure in the other systems and, and the attacker can really have, have a blast. So our mission is, is to really, and we changed our mindset even as we go about, is it's a partnership with customers. You, you have to be like a doctor. You prescribe the right medication. You don't just say, hey, choose one of those and start wherever you want and take the dosage. And so to really get them on this maturity path, and uh, because that worries me if they're not... Uh, um, uh, on that, and of course, there are so many com companies out there that are just don't have this layer at all. And so, how do we take uh, and 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 bring this forward? In terms of going forward, it's actually a very exciting time because we talked a lot about prevention. But what we do and everything we're talking about here, we're also in the in this uh, enablement front of digital transformation. If you want to adopt robotic process automation, for example, that robot needs privilege access and you're replacing manual, you're really taking yourself to the next uh, century. If you can replace, if an insurance company or a bank or others are replacing a manual process with, with a robotic process, but they need privilege access. If you want to move uh, applications to the cloud and use containerization, suddenly there's a, a sprawl of credentials uh, that that these applications need to use. It's called secrets uh, management. So it, it's all about how do we not just be a protective layer and, and help our organizations protect against those sophisticated attackers you talked about, but also allow the CISO to be the hero that is an enabler to adopt uh, the digital transformation technologies that, that are required and, and will we'll take their organizations forward. Right. Well, with any closing? I just want to check with Uri, is, is CyberArk looking into, and, and this is totally just a, a, a thought process, that we are focusing heavily on the privilege access or access management. Is the industry, in your opinion, looking into segmenting the data sets and protecting the data set to a certain point where basically even if the data set is being breached, how can we protect the data set individually rather than taking the whole privilege accounts breach and then accessing the data in totality? Yeah, I think I think, uh, and, and maybe we're alluding more to to DLP and modernizing mm -hmm. uh, deal, uh, data leakage prevention in a way uh, where there will be more understanding. Where it's not just all or nothing, where you didn't have to take everything, um, like in the major breaches, but even that some information can be uh, can be controlled. I would say we we do that more through partnering uh, because okay. we we want to be the ones who who um, secure the keys to the kingdom and and. and uh, and enable this, but we do a lot of integrations, and it kind of relates to, to to the last question. We focus a lot on innovation because the attackers are innovating, and we have this whole team, the CyberArk Labs, who, who are investigating and, and uh, the sophisticated attacks. We're also investing a lot in automation because of that talent shortage that you mentioned earlier. So how can we do more things in an automatic uh, fashion and, and of course modernizing uh, along with our uh, uh, with our customers? But then the third angle is investing time, uh, R&D, engineering time with integration with third-party solutions because we know mm -hmm. that security is a team sport. Yep. Okay, with that, I'll thank you both for your time. It was great meeting you, and Essen, I'll see you at work. <laughs>